Welcome to Wednesday's edition of COVID-19. I'm Min Sun Hee. There continues to be a rise in imported transmissions here in Korea as clear indication of the resurgence in Europe and elsewhere. Accordingly, the global health body has emphasized the need for Europe and the U.S. to look at strategies used in Asia, including those in Korea, to contain the virus. We start the program now with the latest numbers on the pandemic with our Kwon Soa and related news with our Kim Hanul. So I hear the daily tally in Korea has risen. Yes, Sonny, with 91 new infections, that's an increase by 33 transmissions this Wednesday. So while the figure remains in the double digits for the sixth straight day, we are seeing an uptick in both domestic and imported cases. Uh, this Wednesday, Korea saw its highest uh, number of imported infections uh, in 84 days or since July 29th, and this largely attributed to a faster spread uh, on the global front and uh, today Korea reported imported cases from at least seven nations including 10 from France and eight from Russia so let's take a look at this graph now that splits the domestic and imported cases so we do see some uh, fluctuations in both cases here in the domestic uh, front we see that for three days we had cases at 50 or below which is one of the criteria for the level one social distancing measures which we are at right now and when it comes to imported cases we had two days on this uh, eight day span where we had cases above 30 which is quite a rise from what we had in previous weeks so which is also a concern right now and uh, with that Korea now has a total of 25,424 cases three more people lost their lives in the past day raising the death toll to 450 uh, and the people remain remaining in quarantine or are still under treatment has dropped to below 1,400 and we have 118 new recoveries raising that total to 23,584. And now let's take a look at where the new cases emerged. We have 24 cases in Gyeonggi-do province followed by 17 in the capital Seoul and also down in Busan we have 10 new infections and also sporadically uh, single digits in other parts of the country. And uh, as cluster infections at medical facilities as well as door-to-door -door businesses and call centers continue to emerge, uh, especially in the metropolitan region, authorities say we do not see a definite decline in this region yet. I see. So, I meanwhile, on the international front, as I mentioned, the global health body, the World Health Organization, has called on Europe and North America to hold up countries in Asia as examples in containing the spread of COVID-19. Tell us more. Right, Sunny. A senior official at the WHO highlighted that countries like South Korea, China, Japan and Australia have been successful in continuing to follow up on key measures to detect cases and isolate patients and also quarantine anyone that had contact with such patients. So let's take a listen to this. Many of these countries had serious follow through. Once they got the numbers down, they followed through. They didn't start reducing testing centres, they increased testing centres, they didn't start reducing clinical capacity, they increased clinical capacity. In other words, they, they ran through the finish line and beyond and they kept running because they knew the race wasn't over. And he added that too many countries have put an imaginary finishing line. And that is evident if we take a look at the resurgence in many countries. Here the U.S. at 8.5 million and India at 7.6 million. These countries have added some 63,000 and 54,000 cases uh, respectively. And also a concern is, of course, Europe. Uh, we talked about many imported cases from Russia and France, which had over 10,000 and even 20,000 new cases when it comes to France and also 21,000 new cases in the UK which now has a total of over 762,000 infections and uh, over in Italy we also saw that some 10,000 cases have been reported in the past 24 hours and that is also a place where Sunny will connect to in a bit and uh, if we now take a look at the global uh, figures we have 41 million total cases and uh, the daily uh, caseload here is dangerous 
dangerously near 400,000. Also some 6,600 new uh, fatalities and 30.6 million recoveries. And those are the updates I have for now. We do not have uh, a government briefing on Wednesdays, so I will be back here tomorrow. Back to you, Sunny. All right, so I thank you for that. Back on the local front, President Moon Jae-in has urged the government to better protect vulnerable workers whose jobs are being threatened by the pandemic. For more on this, as well as other related news on the economic front, I have our Kim Hanil here in the studio with me. Welcome, Hanil. Good afternoon. Right, Hanil, let's begin with the president's remarks then. Sure, Sunny. During Monday's cabinet meeting, President Moon Jae-in called for more efforts by the government to protect contact laborers um, whose livelihoods are being threatened by the pandemic. Take a listen. 코로나로 인한 불평등은 다양한 분야에서 국민의 삶을 지속적으로 위협하고 있습니다. 대표적인 것이 노동시장의 새로운 불평등 구조입니다. 코로나는 특수고용노동자 등 기존 제도의 사각지대에 있는 노동자들의 삶을 더욱 벼랑 끝으로 내몰고 있습니다. His remarks come following the death of a parcel delivery worker who succumbed to exhaustion stemming from his long working hours. The 36-year-old employee by Hyundai Express was found dead at his apartment last Monday. Another contact delivery worker hired by Logan Logistics, who had been grappling with financial difficulties and poor working conditions, sadly took his own life yesterday. A total of 11 workers in the delivery service industry have died so far this year amid a surge in online shopping and parcel volume being fueled by the pandemic. I know that is both shocking and sad, of course. Now, workers in other industries, I understand, are also facing similar plights, and they were mentioned by the president during his speech as well. That's right. So there are thousands of temporary workers out there who are constantly being faced with the risk of COVID-19 infection. So President Moon Jae-in said temporary occupations, which are predominantly female, such as elderly caregivers, nursing um, assistants, after school instructors, janitors, and babysitters are exposed to the dangers of COVID-19 and have very poor job security. Their jobs require workers to come into physical contact with others, and the danger of their occupations have been highlighted by the recent cluster infections at elderly care facilities in the capital region, as well as the southeastern port city of Busan. So the president urged officials to draw up measures to provide these workers with a much needed support. Well, that is good to know. You know, the government is poised to announce its revamped social distancing guidelines later this month, I hear. Right, so a top health ministry official announced yesterday that the government is planning to overhaul its current prevention guidelines and social distancing measures. So during an undisclosed press briefing yesterday, Son Young Rae, the overall officer for strategy and planning at the Central Disaster Management Headquarters, said the government is looking to implement a new set of rules and guidelines by the end of this month. He said changes to the system will be determined by the results of a broad assessment of the government's containment strategy to date. I see. Hanu, uh, export restrictions on Korean mask manufacturers have been lifted by the government. Tell us more. Sure. The Ministry of Food, Drug and Safety announced yesterday that it will lift its export ban on Korean face masks starting this Friday. So this, this, this decision comes as both the demand and supply of the face masks have been stabilized in the nation in recent months. Under the previous measures, Korean mask manufacturers were not allowed to export more than half of its monthly mask production. They also needed approval from the government when selling more than 200,000 face masks and those who sold 3,000 or more had to report their transactions to the authorities. With Tuesday's announcement, these regulations will no longer apply. What's more, export limits on mask filters will also be lifted this Friday. Companies that produce non-woven fabrics used in face masks will no longer have to cap their exports to 15 percent of their production. But the Food and Drug Ministry said it will continue to monitor the prices to make sure the easing of restrictions does not negatively impact the domestic market. Right. Meanwhile, over in the U.S., health authorities there have announced new guidelines earlier this week, that was, on proper mask wearing. Tell us more. 
Sure. So the U.S. Disease uh, Center for Disease Control said earlier this week that now they strongly recommend wearing face masks for all passengers and all personnel working at public transportation systems across America. So this guideline provides more specific uh, measures for travelers compared to guidelines released previously. The CDC called masks one of the most effective strategies available for reducing COVID-19 transmission and said well-fitted face coverings are most likely to reduce the spread of COVID-19 when they are most widely used by people in public settings. Most U.S. airlines, Amtrak, and many other transport operators already require passengers and staff members to wear masks, but the CDC urged passengers and workers on all forms of transportation, including ships, ferries, subway buses, taxis, and ride shares to follow suit as well. Okay, Hannah, thank you for that. I'll see you again next week. I'll see you then. Right, in related news, recruitment practices have been altered to reflect pandemic concerns and now efforts are underway to assist job seekers to better adapt to this virtual hiring process free of charge. We have details in this next report. The COVID-19 outbreak has changed the way companies hiring their employees. Companies are holding virtual interview and even introduced AI hiring tools. However, it is not just companies that are faced with unexpected challenges. Job seekers, too, are trying to figure out ways to deal with the changes. Many job seekers are experiencing many difficulties during the recruitment process because of the unprecedented global crisis. To help them cope with such challenges, this private institution offers a virtual reality simulation that would allow applicants to conduct a mock interview. They can experience the real setting for a virtual interview and also familiarize themselves with it. 면접에 신 VR은 실제와 같은 면접 관인들이 VR 환경 속에서 내가 선택한 컨텐츠, 내가 하고 싶은 기업이나 직군을 고르면 실제로 면접에서 나오는 질문들을 가장 리얼하게 질문을 해주고요. 스스로 답변을 하는 그런 실제와 같은 모의 면접 연습을 할수 있는 그런 프로그램이라고 할수 있습니다. I visited the private academy that offers the simulation program to experience and see how helpful it is. So this is the special program. So from now on, I am going to have this VR headset on to conduct a mock interview. It was so real that I felt like I was really there. And once you enter, two interviewers are sitting in front of you. So I would say the first one is honor and the second one would be work and the third one would be money because uh, when you value honor first, uh, you want to work because you want to earn that honor. Uh, money follows after all these two. So yes, I could say like that. You can get immediate feedback from interviewers that are customized to your attitudes during the mock interview. Feedback on the mock interview will be available through either text message or email. People can improve performance by correcting their bad habits and knowing areas of improvement they need to develop. So on top of here, uh, this is the information that you typed in during the, uh, at the beginning of the interview. And bottom here, you will be able to see the feedback and the result of your overall interview. Also you can do, interestingly, is you can download the answer that you asked and you can hear it again. I think Samsung is very cool company because it is a leading company. 압박감 속에서 대답하는 연습이 되기 때문에 실제 본인의 실력을 
훨씬 더 실제 면접장에서 어, 마음껏 제대로 발휘할 수 있는 그런 효과가 점점점 더 저희 프로그램이 고도화되면서 어, 더 좋아지지 않을까 그렇게 예상하고 있습니다. COVID-19 changed a lot of things. Our workplaces and job market are no exception. Job seekers are grappling with a tighter job market, yet they are trying best as they can. I hope them are successful in finding a job they wanted with this wonderful VR machine. This has been Shin se -byung. Restrictions have been reintroduced in Europe amid a worldwide resurgence that the World Health Organization is blaming on failure to properly quarantine infected people and their contacts. Now, Italy, for its part, has new stringent measures in place. And for more, I have Irene Dominioni, a journalist based in Milan, live on the line. Good to see you again, Irene. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Irene, let's start then with the COVID-19 situation in Italy. Yes, uh, we have seen um, a burst in cases over the past few weeks. Uh, cases have been increasing steadily since the end of the summer uh, and the beginning of September. But now uh, the situation is getting really worrying. And uh, uh, some experts say it's even explosive. I see. Irene, I understand there was also a confirmed case in the same Vatican residence as Pope Francis. Can you tell us more about this? Yes. Um, um, actually, over the past week, several cases have been happening uh, inside the Vatican. Uh, Swiss guards that are the security forces of, of the Pope have um, have been found positive to the virus. And more recently, one person within the Pope, Pope Francis um, surrounding uh, was found positive, but was promptly isolated, and uh, and all security and and health uh, precautions are being uh, maintained uh, inside the Vatican. The Pope himself is wearing a mask and avoiding contact with believers. Um, so uh, hopefully the situation should be under control. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Irene, authorities there have announced fresh curbs to contain this latest outbreak. What measures, specif specifically that is, are in place? Yes, uh, the Italian government has been raising the level of attention when it comes to measures uh, steadily in the past weeks. Uh, uh, measures have been introduced uh, at least three times, going from mask, we mask wearing at all times, uh, also outside of the house and uh, in every public place. Um, it is also recommended to wear a mask within family circles and friends uh, when it's not people uh, you live with. Um, and uh, more recently, a new decree has introduced uh, shorter uh, opening times for bars and restaurants, which are now meant to close at midnight. Um, and uh, also there are some restrictions on sports, more specifically contact sports uh, and amateur sports. Um, Football is continuing as, as usual, but though with with some uh, precautions. And uh, but uh, measures uh, generally have been seen as kind of uh, uh, blunt and uh, shy from the government. The government is trying to preserve the economy, which was hit hard over the past months. And uh, uh, so uh, experts are asking themselves whether more action is needed, more decisive action is needed in order to contain the virus. Right. Um, Irene, a senior advisor to Italy's health ministry has spoken about difficulties in implementing Korea's COVID-19 strategy in Italy. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, um, we have uh, experts have been looking closely at uh, what's what's happened in Korea, who is an example uh, to all of us. Uh, the Korean model is uh, difficult to apply here, uh, mostly because of uh, limited resources. So. Um, the uh, rise of contagion has already become uh, too um, uh, too fast, according to experts, in, or in order to be able to trace uh, cases effectively. Um, the Korean model, for instance, um, implies and, and uh, foresees mass testing, which is something that we are not being able to do uh, in Italy. Uh, there are about 150,000 tests being done over uh, every day over the, the national territory. But um, 
One expert, uh, for instance, recently said that in order to be effective, the tracing would need at least 300,000 uh, tests per day, which is double. Uh, so we are not managing to, to effectively track down uh, contagion levels uh, in, inside the country. Uh, some areas are more problematic than others. Milan, where I am based, is... Uh, in, the, in its peak uh, right now, uh, the cases are rising fast. So uh, it is a challenge indeed. I see. And how are authorities there explaining the latest surge in cases? Uh, well, um, experts point to uh, a summer uh, where we lived, uh, where Italians lived a regular, uh, regular life. People went on holidays. They were more relaxed also about the restrictions. Uh, they were less careful in mask wearing and uh, hand washing and, and all of the sanitary precaution, precautions that we have been recommended. Uh, so this relaxation led to an increase uh, in, in cases. And even though there are there is a larger chunk of uh, asymptomatic people, um, not, right now hospitals are still being filled uh, quite fast. So uh, that's, that's what we're concerned about. I see. Irene, how is the public responding to the latest stringent measures by the government? Um, uh, to be honest with you, we, like similar country, like other countries, we have had uh, um, no mask uh, movement uh, demonstrating in the streets over over the past days. Um, it's it's actually been contained now. I think people are starting to understand the, that the situation is serious. But having done a lot of sacrifice because of the full lockdown that we experienced during the spring, uh, they are more reluctant to isolate themselves again, although experts and the health minister, uh, Roberto Speranza himself, uh, have called for self-lockdowns, have recommended self-lockdowns and, and trying to uh, limit um, movement and, and all uh, unnecessary transfer. I mean, one final question before we let you go. Footballer Cristiano Ronaldo is back at his residence in uh, Italy, having flown in from Portugal roughly about a day after testing positive last Tuesday, I believe. What quarantine measures are in place for athletes there? Um, well, uh, Serie A, um, the, so the first league of, of football in Italy has... Um, has uh, specific measures in, in place for, for footballers and in order to guarantee that, that games can continue. Um, specifically, teams that have at least uh, 13 uh, players who are not uh, positive to the virus can, can continue playing. But by this, at this point, almost all in Serie A have, been, uh, have had uh, some cases. So... Um, what happened with uh, Ronaldo is that he actually was found positive while he was in Portugal. And as you correctly said, he moved, he recently moved back to, to Italy where uh, the, the regulations uh, changed um, recently. The isolation period has been cut from 14 days to 10 days. And instead of having two negative tests, at the end of the quarantine and now it is only necessary to have one so the conditions were more favorable uh, to him and that's why he he moved back to Turin um, but yeah the, several uh, several football players have been found positive and for them it works pretty much as uh, the rest of us uh, so a quarantine period and uh, they're not allowed to play uh, obviously and and they need a test at the end of the quarantine i see all right irene as always thank you for making the time to join us live at the sal with your thoughts thank you thank you so much for having me First of all, I'm feeling great. I don't know about you. How's everyone feeling? And we're producing powerful therapies and drugs, and we're healing the sick, and we're going through... When you look back at this crisis, everybody can see that this was something that was 
uh, new, that we didn't understand in the way that uh, we would have liked in the first few weeks and months. Pois é, uma medicação que me foi dada pelo médico da Presidência da República, que foi hidroxicloroquina. No dia seguinte eu estava bom já. Se... As medical experts have revealed, COVID-19 does not discriminate, pushing its way into the lives of ordinary people as well as those of world leaders whose individual responses to their diagnosis have received much global attention. For more, I have Dr. Ko myung Hyun from the ASAN Institute for Policy Studies. Welcome back, Dr. Ko. Thanks for having me. And I also have Professor Lee Hoon Sang from Yonsei University. Pleasure to have you back, Professor Lee. Thank you for having me today. Professor Lee, US President Donald Trump triggered much debate given his roughly three-day stay in hospital after his diagnosis and his prompt return back to the campaign trail. Less than two weeks, that is, after his diagnosis. How do you assess his overall health right now? So uh, I think his return was uh, somewhat uh, 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 precarious in terms of uh, his uh, timing of returning uh, because uh, 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 but uh, he seems to be doing fairly well. but. Uh, when we have observed uh, his uh, publicized return uh, that had been televised, uh, it was quite obvious that uh, when he was uh, talking ab about his condition, he was uh, clearly short on breath. So I, I think uh, uh, there had been some condition uh, that had not been uh, uh, quite normal. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and also, but I think what had been done is uh, there had been quite a number of uh, uh, additional treatments uh, that had been uh, given to President Trump, uh, including uh, many of the uh, 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 lambda sphere uh, and also additional uh, uh, monoclonal uh, antibody treatments. Uh, so uh, I think there had been uh, quite a lot of treatment that uh, quite uh, repeated his condition well. But I think he was quite taking a risk uh, for himself, uh, considering his age, and also to uh, I think he was taking risk uh, uh, into, uh, to his staff at the White House as well. But as time progressed on, uh, I think he is uh, 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 now uh, doing all the uh, campaign activities. So it seems like uh, he had been quite lucky uh, so that he, the condition uh, has gotten better. But I think uh, uh, he should be uh, still quite cautious uh, at, the, at this moment. I see. Um Professor Lee, just out of curiosity, one uh, question. We had Irene talking about how there were efforts there in uh, Italy to reduce mm -hmm. the time in quarantine mm -hmm. to from two weeks to 10 days. Mm -hmm. And President Trump himself stayed less than two weeks in quarantine. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this as a doctor? Well, uh, I think uh, reducing uh, time from two, uh, two weeks to 10 days, uh, I think it is uh, some out of uh, uh, overall considerations. Uh, uh, taking the fact that uh, because uh, uh, in uh, Italy uh, there are so many of the cases, so in terms of the longer term sustainability measure, uh, I think they are trying to be somewhat reasonable about how they might be able to adjust uh, 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 lifting uh, uh, limitations uh, from uh, 14 days to uh, 10 days. But uh, the thing is, uh, I mean, science is not uh, uh, always a clear-cut uh, business. And uh, uh, usually, I mean, 14 days is kind of like precautionary uh, uh, measure uh, because uh, the disease can uh, last some time around uh, 20, uh, 14 days, but it can go longer or shorter. So uh, 10 days, uh, 14 days, uh, uh, maybe it might not make a, a lot of difference, but. Uh, if you apply it in the population measure, then it will uh, increase the probabilities that there might be some patients who might not have been uh, uh, perfectly cured. But, but uh, it is some kind of like uh, public policy and or social decisions that you have to, very, uh, you have to make very carefully uh, based on the overall uh, society situations. But the way that uh, President Trump presents is uh, somewhat uh, very haste, uh, in the very haste manner. Uh, so uh, when you make any kind of change of those kind of uh, precautionary uh, detail, uh, 
uh, you have to be uh, extremely careful and uh, it has to go through a lot of consultation. Probably that has been what happened uh, in Italy. But uh, in the case of uh, Trump's remarks, uh, I don't think he it does not have a lot of uh, uh, ground uh, that he can base on. I see. Dr. Go, there are about two yeah. weeks left to the U.S. election day. How does Mr. Trump's COVID-19 diagnosis and recovery look to affect the presidential race? I think uh, President Trump, as uh, Professor Lee has described, took a considerable risk by uh, just staying more or less three days in hospital and then spending less than a week in a recovery process at the White House and took the risk uh, by doing that. But I think politically, he's, uh, he's enjoying some payoffs. And overall, the, uh, right after he, uh, he left the White House to resume the campaign, uh, he went to the battleground states of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Iowa, as well as Florida. And uh, over the, or, or even though the overall polling rate, uh, for poll rating for uh, President Trump nationally is still 10% uh, lower than the, uh, his opponent, uh, uh, Vice President Biden, uh, by around 10% or so. Uh, when you just look at the bat battleground states, actually the gap is narrowing down. So I think uh, he has, has been able to successfully convey this image that uh, uh, he's essentially very strong. And then, and then he, I mean, the United States, uh, when he's undergoing a major crisis like COVID-19 and economic depression, uh, requires a strong leadership. And essentially, there's a uh, overlap between the image he's trying to project and uh, his re remarkable recovery, I would say. So I think uh, there's some payoff. Uh, I mean, he's enjoying some pay political payoff from the. Uh, from leaving uh, the quarantine, I mean, le spending less than a week, two weeks in quarantine, uh, contradicting the recommendation made by the CDC. Uh, but on the other hand, I think uh, politically, I think uh, he essentially has been able to inch back a little bit. But I think, uh, I mean, it, we, one could say that uh, this improvement in uh, uh, poll uh, poor numbers probably came a little bit too late. Uh, it's too little too late, so to speak. And uh, we'll have to see what, what's going to happen in November. Right. Now, meanwhile, before we delve further into infections of world mm. leaders, let's take a moment now to take a look or to explore, that is, a rather interesting study that shows a correlation between a country's fatality rate and the gender of its leader. I have Professor Supriya Garika Party live on the line from the University of Liverpool. Hello, Professor Garika, Garika uh, Party. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for being with us. Professor, um, do tell us a bit about the countries that are faring better given their female leaderships then. Right, uh, so from our uh, total sample of about 200 countries, we had 20 countries that were female led. So this is really a very small sample if you like. Um, if, I mean, most of them seem to have done better when compared to the country that we matched them with. So we use a nearest neighbor matching, um, which means that we matched a female-led country with their nearest male-led country using a host of demographic variables like population, population density, and we use also GDP per capita. Uh, and when we make those comparisons, we find that most of our female-led countries were doing better than their nearest neighbor male-led countries. However, if I have to pick some favorites, those who are front runners, then I would put it down to New Zealand, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Finland, Norway, and Germany. So these are some of the five or six uh, female-led countries that were doing particularly better than their male-led countries. Professor Gariki Party, what was your research that is able to identify some of the reasons perhaps behind this difference between female leaders and their male counterparts in responding to the pandemic? There are three things that really set aside the female leader responses to the coronavirus. Um, if I could identify them in that way. Uh, the first idea is that about seriousness. So female leaders, uh, there is evidence to suggest that female leaders took the virus very seriously and very much in the beginning. So uh, if you remember um, Angela Merkel, Germany's chancellor's speech on the virus, she spoke about it very much in the beginning, even as early as January, about how serious the virus was. She said, this is a serious virus, take it seriously. 
And I believe her citizens took it seriously because of the clear messaging that the leader gave. The second thing was the decisiveness of policy making. So if you again cast back your mind to January, uh, Taiwan's Tai Ing Wan, she put in 124 measures uh, to you know, control and contain the virus very early on, even as early on as January. So this was something like nobody else was even talking about putting measures in place and she was already doing it. And the third thing that makes female leaders really stand apart is the clarity and the new ways of communication that they looked into. For instance, Finland's Sana Marin realized that not everybody watches TV or reads the newspaper. So she started using social media in order to you know, communicate with her people, social media influencers. Jacinda Arden from New Zealand did something very similar. She started using Facebook Live to check in with her citizens on a daily basis. And then there is Norway's Erna Solberg, who communicated directly with children. And these were some of the interesting styles of communications that female leaders chose. So I think those are the three things, really, taking the virus serious early on, decisiveness in policy making, and clarity of communication. And these three things stand out and set aside female leader responses when compared to the matched male responses. I see. Professor Gariki Party, what impact do you see your findings as having on current efforts then to fight the pandemic? Um, I think beyond even just the pandemic, uh, if you think about it, our research rekindles the debate on how female leaders must behave. There has been research that sort of mildly suggests that female leaders may have something interesting and different and beneficial to bring to the table. But this research shows that, uh, you know, female leaders don't need to lean in to be successful. They don't need to be more male-like to be successful leaders. They can be themselves. They can show empathy. They can show better communication skills and get the message across and get the job done. In terms of the pandemic, uh, what this research seems to suggest is there are definitely things that work. Even now, there are countries with leaders where, where, who don't seem to take the pandemic seriously. So I think take the pandemic seriously, be decisive about what you're doing, and communicate your strategies clearly to your citizens. This makes the citizens comply, because once the citizens understand why you're doing what you're doing, they are much more likely to listen to you and to follow the rules. And I think those really are the points that come out quite clearly from the research. All right, Professor Gariki Party, thank you very much for being here with us at this very early hour with your thoughts. Thank you very much for having me. Have a good day. You too, Professor. Right, Professor Lee, what are your thoughts about the findings of Professor Gariki Party's study? Uh, actually, I uh, absolutely agree with some of the uh, uh, points that she made uh, because I think uh, what we are realizing with COVID-19 is that uh, uh, it is no time for the overconfidence or arrogance. Uh, and I think one of the uh, very important aspects uh, that made many countries successful was that how uh, the country's leader uh, was uh, taking the uh, scientific experts' advice very seriously uh, from very early on, uh, and uh, this kind of very considerate and very careful approaches uh, to the pandemic situation, I think, was uh, very crucial. But at the same time, I think it is quite a difficult situation because uh, uh, this COVID-19 uh, or this SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, it is a very new novel virus. Uh, Actually, the sci even the scientific community did not know uh, uh, everything about it. And so there had been quite a lot of uncertainty. So uh, I think it is the time that uh, where leaders has to be both uh, very constrained and very careful uh, uh, to talk with uh, uh, closely, uh, consultate uh, closely with the scientific experts, but at the same time uh, to be very decisive. Uh, and uh, it was very crucial to uh, act on early as possible. Uh, if you lose the timing, uh, many of the country uh, 
they uh, went in the, uh, into the uh, situation that they could not uh, control the community transmission. So uh, I think this kind of uh, uh, female characteristic in a way uh, where you, ca you uh, can be very constrained and very uh, serious about the situation and open to uh, uh, experts' opinions. But at the same time, when you uh, see some of the possible uh, 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 surgeons of the possible uh, situation of uh, danger, then to be very decisive and take the measure uh, as early as possible and not to be uh, arrogantly overconfident about how you can control the situations. And I think this kind of uh, female uh, characteristic in a way uh, uh, speak well and uh, I think we, that we have seen many of the uh, situations as uh, Professor Karpati uh, uh, said uh, in the case of New Zealand, Taiwan, uh, and uh, in Germany as well. Uh, so, but I think uh, it, is, it doesn't have to be always uh, men, uh, male leaders. Uh, countries, countries like Iceland also uh, did a similar uh, uh, measure and then they were also successful as well. So, but I think uh, this study has a quite meaningful uh, result. Dr. Ko, in the case of world mm. leaders who downplay the danger mm. of the virus and then were ultimately affected, do you suppose their attitudes were driven by political motives? So clearly there's a, some factor playing there. I mean, we have to understand that uh, some of the leaders who downplay, initially downplayed, I mean, many leaders actually initially downplayed uh, the seriousness of, seriousness of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, pro partly because it's a novel virus, and uh, secondly because, you know, Many of the countries in Europe and the United, I mean North America and South America, uh, weren't used to experiencing this level or this scale of pandemic uh, coming originating from China. So that's been a challenge initially. But I think of the response that uh, we have uh, seen uh, from different leaders around the world has shown that. Uh, uh, some leaders have been very good at adapting to the situation and understand the risk posed by the pandemic, whereas some leaders uh, haven't been able to do so. So more the representative uh, uh, examples of those uh, leaders would be uh, obviously President Trump of the United States, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, as well as the Brazilian President uh, Jair Bolsonaro. And they tend to, they, the, the commonality across all these three leaders is that they tend they emphasize strong leadership, and at the same time they come from a uh, very conservative background, which means that uh, they emphasize the individual responsibility and downplay the, the role of the state here. So I think of that, I mean, when it comes to handling a public health crisis like COVID-19, a uh, very efficient and then a uh, strong state is very important. I mean, well equipped state actually is very important. Um, but then these leaders, because they tend to em emphasize individual responsibility, try to take the burden, shift the burden from the state to the individuals. And I think that led to the many disasters. And also that led to uh, their own personal uh, experience with COVID-19 because all these three leaders have been infected with uh, COVID-19. But I think uh, depending on the seriousness of the condition that uh, they experienced, the, the aftermath of the, uh, the response, after their personal uh, brush with the uh, the, or say the disease, the response have differed. I mean, because of President Trump and Bol President Bolsonaro, their condition happened to be rather mild. Uh, this uh, emphasis on the strong leadership and downplaying the state response has continued. Whereas with uh, Prime Minister Johnson, because his condition has been reported to be very serious, so as he came out of the, the I mean, uh, the, the, I mean, the, I mean, after he recovered from the disease, uh, he essentially changed the policy, and then he tried to be more proactive and more encompassing when it comes to handling the disease. And staying with that, Professor Lee, as Dr. Go just mentioned, after his fight with COVID-19, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has waged a war against obesity. He is convinced that his weight was responsible for the severity of his infection. What are your thoughts on this change in attitude for the better public health, so to speak? So uh, clearly, uh, uh, compared to his age, he has had been uh, he was somehow uh, in the obese uh, uh, status. And also, maybe there might have been some of the underlying condition that might not have been known, um, which might have uh, aggravated the uh, condition, so which might uh, uh, contribute to the worsening uh, symptom uh, for him. But, but I think uh, uh, as a result overall, I think what he is doing right now is very different from uh, uh, President Trump or uh, the President uh, Bolsonaro from the Brazil. Uh, so, uh, earlier on, uh, in terms of their response, in the earlier response, I think all of three of them uh, had been uh, quite similar in their response, uh, and in terms of their country's uh, COVID-19 response. And, uh, but 
Uh, right now, the Boris, uh, uh, Minister, uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Boris Johnson's uh, attitude is, I think, quite recommendable. I think he is now taking things very seriously. And also, he is reminding people how serious this uh, COVID-19 situation is and uh, not to uh, uh, take, uh, downplay uh, in any regard. So, uh, and in terms of uh, uh, taking on this uh, obesity campaign, I think he is uh, uh, doing uh, things on the quite right course. But the regrettable, regrettable thing is, if we had taken that kind of measure earlier on, in, uh, like in uh, April, uh, February or March, I think the UK would, had, would have been in a, uh, totally on a, uh, in different situation. So, but still, I think it better than uh, never. So, I, uh, or better than late. So, I think he is doing it quite right uh, at this moment. Right. Uh, Dr. Go, one final very short mm. question, of course, to you. The public here in Korea, compared to their counterparts elsewhere around the world, appear to have more faith mm. in the government's response to COVID-19. Mm. Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, clearly the South Korean government performance when it comes to handling the pandemic has been exemplary. I mean, we all know that. I mean, we, we are hearing from uh, other parts of, I mean, other opinion leaders that the Korea is the role model for their own countries in handling the pandemic. And I think it has paid off politically for President Moon. Um, we know that uh, the general election that took place in April actually took place in during while well, at the height of the pandemic and then he handled it really well so and I think it's going to continue and it's going to be an asset for him uh, going down the road. I see. All right Dr. Go as always thank you for your thoughts and Professor Lee thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, that ends Wednesday's edition of COVID-19. Tomorrow, we have experts reassessing the economic impact of the pandemic and offering some possible ways to address this plight. Do join us again then. Thank you for watching now.